Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we hold the Lib Ten Alliance meetings every month, and all are uh, all are uh, welcome to attend. Uh, tonight we have uh, Philip Keane on the significance of Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Yeah. So, oh, thank you. Um, okay, so um, I should probably begin by pointing out that. Um, my interest in Bitcoin is actually quite academic. I actually haven't invested in Bitcoin myself, but I'm quite interested in the mechanism of it. I think that's my background as a software engineer. I'm interested in, uh, I've, always, I've been getting quite interested recently in how it all works. Um, but of course, uh, no, as someone who's interested in personal or individual liberty, um, I'm fascinated by the fact that it began as a libertarian project. Um, and so I've, I began to think, well, actually, how far has it got? Has it succeeded in its aims? Is it likely to succeed? And also, actually, what will its legacy be? And I think uh, if you've, if there's a, I, if I hope, I hope if there's a takeaway from uh, tonight, is that, well, Bitcoin might actually end up, you know, advancing the cause of individual liberty, but maybe not in ways that we uh, originally thought it might do. And actually, it might be remembered not, say, as the first cryptocurrency, but actually the first use of the blockchain. So there, it could be that actually its legacy might not be as, uh, 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 well, it, it might not have uh, developed in the way that its creators intended. So what I'm going to do is briefly try and describe Bitcoin. And unfortunately, um, I am going to try and describe a bit about how it works. Um, but that's only because when I talk about some of its underlying technologies, um, I won't be just saying meaningless words at you. Um, but I do apologise. I'll try not to get too technical. OK, so uh, what Bitcoin is, is an attempt to decentralise digital money and sort of make, uh, try and produce some system of uh, uh, digital money that, exists out, that can exist outside any sort of regulatory framework. So before Bitcoin, we have dig we have uh, digital money. Uh, we had do, uh, we had digital money, um, but no, it was just digital versions of national currencies. And no, uh, I'm quite sure that, you know that any that, that most pounds that exist that exist today aren't in forms of notes or coins. They're actually uh, numbers and databases, say in, uh, in the Bank of England or in, in the uh, or in the banks across the land. And um, so this, this uh, system sort of works, but it has to be highly regulated in order to make sure that everyone's honest and that no one's cheating. So for instance, um, if I do my weekly Ocado shop, um, I have to prove to Ocado that I have the necessary funds to uh, pay them. Um, and of course, Ocado uh, can't take my word for it. What they have to do is uh, hear from my bank, uh, get my bank to vouch for me that yes, he uh, can pay you with genuine pounds. Uh, you can send him his groceries and you'll get your money eventually. And so um, there has to be some sort of trusted third party, like a bank or something, in some sort of uh, digital transaction normally. Um, so what uh, Bitcoin was trying to do was saying, well, actually, can we uh, remove sort of these uh, uh, regulations and still get a digital, some sort of digital money that works? So can we, um, so for uh, can we actually um, in, in a situation where actually no one has any re reason, uh, immediate reason to trust any, any other, can we build a, uh, produce a mechanism that actually generates trust between people? So, um, uh, so uh, how? Uh, well, so it's, the good question is how does this work? And this is uh, where the mechanics of it come in. So, um, of course, if you're just using Bitcoin. Um, uh, as an ordinary user, you don't see any of this. So what you do, if you want to uh, uh, buy or sell using Bitcoin, you create a Bitcoin address and maybe um, swap some pounds to, for Bitcoin to add to your address. And a, a Bitcoin address is, it's an imperfect an analogy, but you can think of it a bit like a bank account. It's, uh, that's actually a very, probably a very bad analogy, but if, it's, at least it's one way to think about it. And now, if I want to uh, pay someone else uh, Bitcoin, I, I need to know their Bitcoin address. And what I can do is then um, sign an instruction that says, OK, pay, uh, move X amount of Bitcoin from my account, say account A, to uh, 
uh, say, uh, Mark's Bitcoin address, account B, and I can digitally sign that uh, transaction to show that I approve that um, the, I hold uh, to prove that uh, as the account uh, account holder of for account A, I approve of this transaction, and I can submit this to the network. And if the network as a whole agrees with this transaction, if they approve of it, then Mark can treat uh, those their, those X bitcoins um, as his own. So uh, you uh, so it's actually a reasonably simple process. Um, I mean, a little, uh, not so easy as simply playing, uh, paying cash, but you don't see any of the, uh, um, the underlying mechanics. Um, so in order to try, to try and explain a bit more about how Bitcoin works under the hood, what I thought I might try uh, to do is start off, make a first pass at actually trying to come up with my own cryptocurrency and then see why it absolutely fails. Okay, so... What's, what are you going to try and do with a cryptocurrency? Well, you're going to try and get um, come up with a system whereby, um, say, if Alice wants to goes into Bob's cafe and wants to buy um, a cup of coffee from Bob, she can provide him with um, a genuine digital coin that Bob, Bob can uh, see as genuine and that he can is willing to swap for a cup of coffee. Um, but the uh, Problem is, well, how can you prove that a coin is genuine? And indeed, if it's a, in a completely decentralized world, what does it mean for a coin to be genuine anyway? Okay, so what what uh, can we do? So, of course, going back to my Ocado example, um, the, my bank was there to vouch for me that um, the digital money I was offering Ocado actually were genuine pounds. They actually did ultimately originate with the Bank of England, and so um, and I got them legally. And so I, they can accept them as payment. But then, once again, what can we do in our case? And so, without any sort of third party to vouch for me, what can, or third party to vouch for Alice, what can Alice do? Well, there's one thing um, that she can do. If she can uh, show uh, Bob uh, the transaction history associated with a digital, digital coin and show that actually it came it is genuinely hers and it is genuinely worth something then bob should be willing to um, swap it for a cup of coffee or or swap a cup of coffee for it i should say and so what um i'm going to do with my cryptocurrency is say okay um i'm the only one who is allowed to issue uh, cryptocurrencies so um at any point of my choosing i can um bring a digital coin into existence define it into existence um, I can uh, say write a statement saying I'm creating digital coin um, number one two three four five and I'm uh, giving it to say s such and such a person and I can digitally sign that and that's perfectly fine. So no one else can do that. Say if, if someone else attempted to write the same statement and sign it, it would just be complete nonsense. It's uh, not a, a genuine coin at all. But what the someone else can do is say if a coin comes into their possession, they can sign it over to someone else. And then um, that coin then becomes that the other person, it belongs to the other person. And so this is, we can build up a transaction history this way. So uh, a valid transaction history would begin with me, uh, with my statement, hey, I'm cre creating this uh, coin and I'm paying it to such and such a person. And then um, it would consist of a chain of valid sign overs to uh, 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 um, uh, people down the line. And the thing about digital signatures is that um, no one else can forge them. And you can check, um, and so uh, if you've got this sort of transaction history, it's not the type of thing that you, you can forge. So if Alice wants to uh, present a valid, show Bob she has a genuine uh, coin in my currency, she can present a transaction history that starts with me and ends with her, and she can show Bob that she, as proof that she has a coin that she can offer him as payment. And so Bob can then say, OK, I'm happy with that. Sign it over to me so it becomes mine and you can have your cup of coffee. So this sort of works well in a way because uh, we don't have we don't have the uh, we can get away without having a someone standing by having to vouch for Alice and her coin. But there are two major problems with it. The first uh, one is obvious. I'm a central bank. Um, if I decide to go mad and uh, create coins, um, uh, willy-nilly, uh, then you know, I completely destroy the value of the coin for everyone else. But there is another deeper, subtle, more subtle problem, 
and that's absolutely fatal for this um, uh, uh, for my coin. This is the problem is um, a, a transaction his a transaction history is a digital file, and digital files can be copied. So what um, uh, what Alice can do, she can go to Bob, show the, uh, the transaction of history of her coin, and say, hey, look, I've got a coin I can offer you for a cup of coffee. Bob can say, okay, sign it over to me, you can have your coffee. And uh, Alice, uh, and so the transaction happens, everyone's happy. Then what Alice can do is actually be quite sneaky. She can go next door to Chris's bakery and say, uh, show him a, the copy of the same transaction history and say, hey, look, I have a digital coin I can uh, offer you for that cross on. Uh, how about we uh, do a deal? And uh, Chris can say, okay, that's a genuine uh, coin that came into your possession. Uh, but of course, he doesn't know that Alice has already signed that coin over to Bob uh, next door. So uh, Alice can sign the, coin, sign the copy over to Chris and Chris can swap, uh, give uh, Alice the uh, croissant on return and Alice, Alice scarpers. Now this is, what, is what's called a double spend um, and trying to prevent the, these is one of the major problems that cryptocurrencies face. Um, now, uh, there is a way we can get around it. Say if I offer, if I want to save my currency, I can offer to run a, a server that uh, uh, keeps a ledger and anyone who actually wants to pay uh, a coin to someone else, they have to submit the transaction to me. And then um, as long as I'm happy that it's a valid uh, transaction, that um, it's not a double spend, I'll put it on the server, uh, in the ledger on the server, and then it's official. Um, uh, the transaction can go ahead. Um, but of course, this is even worse because now we've centralized things even further. Um, if my server goes down, then that's uh, <laughs> nothing, no one is going to pay anyone anything. Uh, but also, it's, it's given me actually a lot of power. So for instance, if I decide one day that I don't like Alice very much, I can just decide to ignore any transactions she submits to me. And in a sense, in essence, I've frozen her funds. Um, and of course, there's also the danger that I could just wake up one day and say, you know, stuff this, um, there's better things to do with my life and just abandon the entire thing and leave everyone high and dry. So unfortunately, my attempt at a cryptocurrency hasn't worked. But, you know, it did have one uh, nice thing about it. Um, I managed to come up with some way of some idea of actually uh, proving that someone has a, gen uh, a genuine coin. Maybe it needs tweaking, but the, uh, maybe the idea of having a transaction history that proves a genuine coin could, be, uh, could work. And this is actually what um, Bitcoin does. Um, it uh, takes the idea of a transaction history um, to, prove the, uh, to prove that a coin is genuine, but it actually also solves the problem of the double spend and, uh, and manage to, manages to, to authoritatively sta um, establish a, a proper transaction history for, um, uh, for, the, for Bitcoin. And so how does it do this? Okay, so it insists that all transactions must be public. So um, if so for FX, Bitcoins move from account or from address A to address B, everyone knows that. Now, people might not, it's not necessarily the case that people will know the real life identities behind those Bitcoin addresses, but the simple fact that uh, um, a Bitcoin has moved from one address to another will always be public. And instead of a central server, like I was uh, suggesting, um, what uh, Bitcoin does is it opens the management of the ledger to everyone. So every, everyone who wants to join in can have their own server, um, keeping their own copy of the ledger. And the ledger is actually structured in a particular way. So the idea is that um, you, the ledger stores transactions in groups, and they're uh, called blocks. Uh, and the, these blocks are time stamped. And the idea is that the, uh, the ledger is made up of a, a list of these blocks, and each block is linked to the first. Um, and <clears throat> the, Id uh, the idea is that uh, uh, there is uh, there is some sort of um, some sort of uh, algorithm that whereby everyone can uh, follows, and whereby everyone is able to agree on the next block to add to the ledger. And so the idea uh, the idea is that. So collectively, um, without any need for any sort of central authority, 
um, people can maintain this sort of uh, uh, synchronized sort of common history. And this, this sort of uh, setup is what's called a blockchain. Um, I've just, uh, described it in very broad terms because actually blockchain is uh, it's actually a very broad uh, concept. It's the idea of maintain, um, ma um, any s this sort of system that maintains a li these, um, uh, this ledger of ordered blocks across um, an entire network um, without, and, and with sort of collective uh, decision making. Uh, now this seems very strange. It's actually it seems sort of magical. Um, how uh, uh, how does Bitcoin actually manage to do this? What's what's this magical decision process? Um, especially if it sounds like you actually have to be quite cooperative. I mean, uh, and and why would anyone do that? It's actually quite a clever um, uh, a, a, a clever procedure for actually um, adding a new block to uh, the blo uh, the blockchain. What happens is that Bitcoin defines a competition. So any time, if the time comes to add a new block to the blockchain, there's a competition between all everyone who's managing uh, the ledger. Everyone is, uh, is, set the, uh, is offered the opportunity to suggest a new block to be added. Um, now, in order to the block, for the block to be acceptable, um, the it has to pass all the accounting rules. So, for instance, it has to be a valid. It has to include only valid transactions. There can't be double spends. If uh, if anyone tries to suggest a block with these sorts of things, they can be pretty confident that no one else is going to accept the block. And the uh, the other thing uh, that the block has to do, they have to be a, a tweak the block in such a way that it meets the set cri criteria. Now, I'm being deliberately very vague there, but. Um, uh, because it's actually <laughs> the competition is actually quite uh, it's actually uh, 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 quite technical um, or it, I could uh, it, to describe it properly is talk, means me having to talk about cryptographic hashes and whatnot. So I'm not going to <laughs> uh, go into that level of detail. But there's um, the idea is that the uh, that the um, so that anyone who's suggesting a block has to keep on tweaking it until it meets the set criteria, then uh, they know that actually it will be accepted by any um, one, uh, by everyone else. Now this seems a bit strange, it doesn't seem like much of a competition, but I can, um, I can give you uh, uh, an assurance that um, this block tweaking is actually essentially done blindfold. Um, they, uh, it's a bit like uh, for the person uh, trying to produce a block. It's a bit like uh, throwing a, a dart at the a dartboard blindfold and trying to hit the bullseye. So it's a bit. It's actually there's a little bit of randomness to it. But um, so suppose you uh, suppose so everyone takes part in the competition. But if there's a competition, then there's got to be a prize, right? So if you win the competition, that means that you get to create um, new bitcoins and add them to your own address and pick up any transaction fees that anyone has included with the uh, with their transactions. Um, I should point uh, point out here. This is how uh, bitcoins are created. So uh, gone are my central bank ways. Um, I've been replaced by everyone else. So anyone who wins the competition to uh, propose a new block. Uh, wins the right to pay themselves in Bitcoin. Uh, I should also point out that actually the number of Bitcoins they can pay, uh, people can pay themselves over, diminishes over time. So the idea is that there's only going to, ever going to be a finite number of Bitcoins available. And the deliberate analogy here is with gold, because gold is a finite resource. And this is why um, you often, uh, uh, that why people who take part in these competitions are called Bitcoin miners. So if you want, even want, wanted to know what Bitcoin mining was all about, it's that. It's, a, it's the competition to uh, uh, produce new blocks. And so this is actually, when you think about it, is quite a clever, um, a clever setup because um, out of self-interest, uh, people are willing to uh, uh, keep the, uh, the blockchain going, keep, the, uh, keep it a live system. But also, um, it's actually very difficult for them to cheat. So it's actually in their, also in their self-interest, if they want to get uh, Bitcoin, to actually contribute constructively towards the maintenance of the system. And so, um, th uh, so this is actually one of, I think, one of the really clever ideas about uh, Bitcoin. And actually this, 
people have been thought this is actually a really clever setup. Can we actually um, use that the the sort of blockchain ideas in other areas of uh, uh, in other areas of the uh, life as well? I'll get onto that in a minute. But also, I, I just want to take a moment here to sort of admire the qualities of the system that we've just produced. So, for instance. Um, it's actually quite resilient. So if lots of people are taking part, that means there are lots of copies of the ledger around. And so if one server crashes, it's no great disaster. It means there, is just, there are lots more copies of the ledger around. It's transparent because the, um, the transactions are public knowledge. It's actually quite speedy as well. If, uh, as soon as the, a, block has, or a, a transaction has been accepted into a block, then it, the transaction is done and almost and pretty much all, everyone knows about it within minutes also it's uh, and the major thing it's decentralized there's no need for someone with a stick and a rule book uh, law, watching over everyone saying are you uh, obeying the rules it's actually in everyone's self-interest to uh, obey the rules um, if, it, if they actually want to benefit from the system Okay, so it's it's a clever setup, but it's Bitcoin hasn't been universally um, accepted. In fact, I think uh, people are still quite a lot. It, it still meets a lot of suspicions in um, quarters. And I, the real problem is, um, I think a lot of the suspicion, suspicion uh, stems from the fact that there's actually nothing backing it. So, for instance, if uh, if you want to. If I've got a pound coin in my pocket, it's worth something ultimately because I have to pay uh, taxes to the British government in pounds. So if I if I want to um, uh, say buy a Mars bar, I can probably say uh, find someone who uh, will be interested in my pound coin, save for their uh, uh, to settle their uh, bill with HM, HMRC or something <coughs> or something like that. Also, um, say uh, gold, an older form of money, it has some sort of intrinsic value, or I can be confident that if I have a bar of gold, someone else is going to be interested in it. I mean, it's gold's pretty, it's durable, it's a high value. Uh, actually, uh, personally, I have no use for gold whatsoever. Um, I have no skill as a jeweler, and even if I did, I don't think gold earrings would suit me. But I'm fairly confident that I can find, if I have a bit of gold, I can find someone else who is interested in, in it and is willing to swap me uh, a bit of gold for something I, I am interested in. So, um, so usually some currency or money has some intrinsic value to it or some, uh, so, uh, something about it that means that it's worth something to someone else. Uh, Bitcoin doesn't really uh, do that. Um, uh, Bitcoin only really works if people collectively agree that it has some value. So, and I think um, I've heard this described as the Tinkerbell effect. So, uh, I think the idea is that in Peter Pan, Tinkerbell only exists if you believe in her. Uh, and so, the idea is that as long as we collectively agree that Bitcoin is worth something, then then we can use it as a um, uh, as a currency. But actually, how stable is that? Um, uh, as for my own uh, uh, point of view, uh, I think I, I acknowledge that, uh, yeah, I acknowledge the difficulty, but I'm not, I, I'm actually in the wait and see school. Um, maybe the Tinkerbell effect actually is a genuine thing. Maybe actually it is the, it can act, actually um, act as a, um, no, the basis of a long term stable, or, or a long, uh, maybe it does mean in the long term Bitcoin can continue to act as a, uh, some sort of me, uh, meaningful unit of exchange, but maybe not. I'm just, uh, for me, the school, uh, it, it's the jury's still out. Um, but uh, looking at the current situation, I do have my concerns. So for instance, um, I, a lot of people seem very interested in the price of Bitcoin and sort of uh, measuring its success in terms of the dollar price. And I actually don't, I think that's the wrong measure. I think actually if you want to measure how, uh, how successful Bitcoin is, you should actually be um, seeing how widely is it, is it accepted as a means of paying for goods and services. That's when it's really being used as a, no, for its original purpose. Um, and I actually was just checking um, 
uh, just before. I think there are 17 Bitcoin ATMs in London, and I think about 69 businesses across uh, London that accept Bitcoin as payments. I mean, so it's, no, there are people who accept it, but it's hardly widespread. Um, and it does worry me uh, that actually a lot of the attention or that Bitcoin receives is to do with its uh, dollar price. I can't help, I can't help but wonder actually for a lot of people is Bitcoin a means to sort of, you know, uh, a bit of an investment. If I buy Bitcoin now, will uh, will it increase, continue on increasing in the future? And can I find a greater fall to sell it on to, uh, on to later when actually the price has increased? But who knows? Um, who knows what will happen? Um, so I, 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 so for me, ultimately, I'm not sure if Bitcoin will work in the future. I could well see maybe it completely crashing and people lose completely losing faith in it. Faith in it. Maybe it will crash, but then people say, actually, it was. It's still a good idea, but we need to be a little more sensible about it. Um, I don't know. Who knows? Uh, it's, for me, the jury is still out. But I think um, ultimately, my the. Uh, what for me the real interest about Bitcoin is actually the underlying technologies or the technologies associated with it, say for instance with blockchain, because I think there we do actually have some uh, genuine opportunities to say decentralize um, say the business of government and actually uh, actually do ac have some opportunities to advance uh, no to advance li individual liberty in a way. Um, so uh, there's been actually one of the technologies that has been um, associated with uh, cryptocurrencies recently are smart contracts. Um, these actually predate, uh, the idea of smart contracts predates uh, cryptocurrencies, but it was really Bitcoin where the, I think where the use of them was pioneered, as it were, where it, uh, they were actually uh, came into their own. So a, a smart contract is, is in a sense a contract that implements itself. It's actually a piece of code. So it's a um, it's a code that defines an agreement, but also carries that agreement out. Um, I'll, I'll give an example that hopefully explains it a bit better. Um, so uh, in Bitcoin, it's possible to set up an escrow uh, transaction. So suppose Alice wants to buy a T-shirt from, uh, from Bob's um, mail order business. Now, Bob would actually ideally like the um, to receive the money beforehand because uh, otherwise, he's a bit worried that he could send, just send the um, the T-shirt to Alice and never hear, hear anything of her again. But and of course, um, Alice would prefer to pay cash on delivery because otherwise um, she could send money to Bob and just not hear of it, any, uh, not receive any T-shirt at all. So what can they do? Well, in Bitcoin, you can actually set up um, a multi-signature transaction, and so each uh, what. Alice can, and Bob can do is say, let's agree on a mediator. Um, let's agree that if the, uh, let's bring in, uh, say, someone like a courier who can um, uh, sign that they actually delivered uh, the T-shirt to Alice. So, and the idea is if Alice and Bob are both happy with the transaction, uh, they can sign and the funds will pass to Bob, otherwise, otherwise um, if, and if, uh, yeah, so essentially the idea is that um, they can set up an escrow transaction where they ha there are three signat uh, possible signatories, Alice, Bob, or the, um, the mailman, or the courier, and the idea is t if two out of the three people sign, then actually the money passes um, from Alice to Bob, and if the, if the necessary numbers of signatures don't happen within a certain amount of time, actually the money just reverts to Alice. This is actually safe for both, uh, for everyone involved, for both Alice and Bob. So, for instance, suppose um, Bob is dishonest. He says he sent the T-shirt, but um, he actually hasn't. So he could sign the transaction saying, yes, I want the money. Uh, but Alice could refuse to sign saying, actually, no, I haven't got the T-shirt. And the courier might just not sign saying, well, I, actually, I, I haven't delivered it. So then, um, because the, num uh, the number of uh, necessary signatures hasn't been added to the transaction, the money eventually reverts to Alice. Um, now suppose Alice is um, dishonest and she says, actually, I, I didn't receive the t-shirt when actually I did. Well, Bob can sign the transaction saying, yes, I sent the um, t-shirt. And the courier can sign the transaction saying, yes, I delivered it. 
Um, and uh, and then the money must pass immediately pass from Alice to Bob because um, uh, th because the number of signatories has because you got two out of the three sig signatures. And so the uh, idea is because Alice and Bob have agreed to this arrangement beforehand, none of them can back out. And then once uh, uh, once uh, two two people have agreed that the transaction has gone ahead. That's enough to establish um, that the transaction has gone ahead and that the money can pass uh, uh, go from Alice to Bob. That's a very sort of highly um, uh, you know, highly artificial example. That's probably not how it would be happening in real life. I was just trying to give you an, an example of uh, how it could be set up on a Bitcoin. And so. Um, uh, so I think there'd be a lot of uh, interest in actually, well, can we get these, uh, uh, make uh, do more things with these smart contracts? Because they're interesting, because because they implement themselves, we don't need anyone sort of overseeing them, um, and they, um, and because we know that we can be confident that they'll they'll always uh, see out their obligations. There'll be no need for you no know, courts afterwards. Um, when someone hasn't lived up to their side of the bargain, because they must, they, they can't but live up to their side of the bargain in a smart, in a smart contract. Um, and actually, it's uh, Bitcoin um, is actually, I, I think, fallen a bit by the wayside in terms of uh, smart contracts. It does offer smart contracts, but it's actually deliberately very. It only offers a very limited uh, 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 ways you can implement them. Um, those who are interested in smart contracts, I think, tend to be more interested in Ethereum, um, which uh, has its own uh, soli uh, uh, solidity language, and that's a, a language in which you can write uh, smart contracts. And actually, it's a Turing complete language, which means you can actually write any pro computer program you like in solidity. Um, that's kind of nice because it means you can actually write some really intricate and powerful contracts, but actually, that's actually really dangerous as well. Um, uh, because uh, as a computer, co as a coder, I can assure you that the more things a language can do, the more ways things can go wrong. Um, and I think, uh, I guess, if you're uh, familiar with a lot of cryptocurrency or smart contracts, you've probably heard of the DAO, um, which was on Ethereum. Um, if you don't, that's fine. So the DAO was a, actually a smart contract. It was set up to try and be, um, DAO stood for a decentralized autonomous organization. The idea was that it would be try, try and be like a venture capital firm, but actually uh, completely automatic with just the smart contract running things. And the idea was that people would sign up to it and they could all vote on where their money should be invested. Um, the problem was that in the uh, smart contract there was a balance function that was used, and if you could, if you called it, was it? I think if you called it recursively in the right way, you could actually withdraw continually withdraw uh, money from the organisation at no cost. Um, this, they, this was. Uh, I think the people behind DAO realised this, but went ahead anyway. And what happened was someone figured that it saw the uh, vulnerability and exploited it and I think uh, withdrew I think 50 million dollars worth of uh, uh, ether um, um, and uh, I think this was actually uh, this forced Ethereum actually to uh, actually almost uh, this is what caused Ethereum to do their hard fork um, a few years ago so actually instead of letting um, letting this uh, 50 million uh, get, stay with this person. They essentially rewound history and then said, OK, we'll start again from this point and um, completely ignore what happened with the DAO business. Um, but, in, but arguably, was the person who was uh, doing this doing anything wrong? Because um, the code is the contract. And so if they're using the um, code uh, in a, a way that's... Put, that uh, is permitted, if they're just using the code as code, then actually they're doing nothing wrong. They're meeting the terms of the contract and it's, it's just they're, in a way, exploiting a loophole. So I think uh, smart contracts are interesting, but they, uh, I think uh, you have to be careful with them. They do contain their hidden dangers. Okay. Um, the other, uh, if, oh, I just want to check, I haven't been droning on too long, sorry. Um, 
I think the other, uh, for me, the other interesting thing is the blockchain itself, because um, what you have here is a technology that allows uh, uh, you to uh, sort of maintain a distributed uh, system of records without any need for a central authority, and that actually it can even cross national boundaries. Um, and actually, there's been a lot of interest in, uh, in what blockchain is capable of doing. Uh, there is there are is some cool stuff. There isn't necessarily anything uh, uh, that it, it arguably isn't anything to do with a, a, a individual liberty, uh, advancing individual liberty. For instance, smart property. Um, it's uh, you can get a, um, a a car to listen to the uh, Bitcoin blockchain, and you can. It's actually possible to tag uh, you know a, a tiny amount, a, a small Bitcoin uh, with the car. Um, with a tag saying, whoever owns this Bitcoin control it owns uh, this particular car. And uh, so the idea is that uh, if Alice owns the car at the minute, it, 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 she would have uh, a key fob with her um, Bitcoin address details on it. And because she uh, has that, her account owns that uh, particular CAD tag toy, coin, her key fob will open the car. She can open the car and drive away quite happily. And if she wants to sell the car, say to Bob, um, she can actually just transfer the, uh, the, that tagged coin to Bob. The car will pick, uh, pick up, oh, I've changed owner. Uh, Bob, with his key fob, will then be able to open the car and drive away quite happily. Of course, you might say, well, what's wrong with just swapping key, uh, passing a key over? <laughs> but I guess the nice thing about that is um, not only do you have a way of passing ownership, you actually have an audit trail as well. So you've got proof that actually... Um, Alice, um, Alice passed the title to the car over to Bob without any need, for, maybe for any central registry, central registry of car titles. Who knows? Um, but I think uh, there's one potential as aspect, uh, application of um, blockchain that has got has had a bit of attention, but maybe not major attention. And actually, I, I kind of own a, owe a, a debt to. Um, a YouTuber called Dave Cullen for pointing this out. Um, actually, blockchain might uh, help in, uh, with uh, freedom of speech. So we've had a bit of a problem with social media platforms in the recent years. Uh, I mean, they're very popular, like Facebook, Twitter, a lot of people are on these things. But of course, that means um, they're very their targets for regulation uh, by governments who might be worried about what people are saying or worried about perceived consequences of people saying controversial things online. And of course, you've all, all heard the uh, concerns about fake news in recent years. But um, but uh, there, there have been, uh, uh, very uh, recently, the governments have began, begun to pressure the social media platforms to actually censor speech more and more. So for instance, this is in, fr from an article uh, in Spike last year. So from the 2nd of June 2016. Yesterday, the European Union's powerful unelected executive branch, the European Commission, announced sweeping plans to combat illegal online hate speech. Okay. Yeah, working with equally powerful IT companies, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and Microsoft, the European Commission unveiled a code of conduct that will ensure online platforms do not offer opportunities for illegal online hate speech to spread virally. Upon receiving a valid removal notification, IT companies will have to remove or disable access to the content in less than 24 hours. And the art article goes on later to say, so what exactly is the content that IT companies have been given blanket authority to censure? According to EU law, illegal hate speech means all conduct um, publicly inciting violence or hatred directed against a group of persons or a member of such a group defined by reference to race, colour, religion, descent or national or ethnic origin. And the, uh, spike co uh, the, uh, the author go goes on to comment, leaving aside the incitement to violence aspect of the definition, which is largely uncontentious. Hate speech, hate speech is defined as including incitement to hatred, which is both circular and so vague to mean almost anything. Um, and so uh, this is a, a, a sort of a worrying development I've seen in recent years. Um, and so even with uh, this hanging over them, the, 
the the incentive for Facebook, for YouTube, <coughs> all these social media platforms, the incentive to them in the um, in the face of all this is to start actually do, uh, implementing their own self censorship uh, policies that potentially are too, a little bit too zealous because they don't want to um, uh, be dealing with this. And so, if they can avoid this happening, then um, no, they they avoid a lot of hassle. And so, um, what could, how could blockchain help in this? Well, if you th look, think back to blockchain, it's um, a, you could think of it as actually like a distributed database that's not centrally managed, but that is, is yet reliable and resilient, and you can uh, you can trust uh, it to store records um, uh, accurately. And so instead of having a social media platform backed up by, say, a centrally managed database like or, or some sort of central organization, some sort of organization like Facebook, why not have a, um, a social media application that saves things to a particular blockchain? And this blockchain is then is is then open to anyone to uh, manage, to uh, host, uh, can cross um, national borders. So actually, it can sort of um, sort of bypass, ho hopefully bypass a lot of these uh, regulations. So, uh, so you do have um, social media platforms like this starting up already. For instance, Steemit is one. That is a social media platform that has some that uses a blockchain um, as a as a database. And if the concern was raised about the content that was being stored on this, the Steemit blockchain, Steemit can raise their hands and saying hey, we're just defining a protocol. We are, actually don't manage that. We don't own any, any of those servers. Um, uh, you can't, t uh, we just can't help you if we want that uh, content removed. Um, but, uh, which is, uh, I think, a, an interesting idea. But I think the issue then comes, well, but then what's the incentive for the people to actually take part and mon uh, actually keep maintain this blockchain? Um, uh, and I found that actually, what the tends to live, the incentive tends to be uh, a, a cryptocurrency. So um, it's an, I, I, I sort of get the feeling that actually it's a nice idea. Maybe it's a, a nice idea to have a, a social media platform that sort of um, can, can sort of bypass the um, uh, sort of uh, national laws. But at the same time, it kind of depends on, once again on cryptocurrencies actually working as money. So and so that's where um, I am. Um, uh, yeah, and I. Uh, yeah, I think that's a. Uh, 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 where Do you have I am. questions? Yeah, I've been progressing. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Thank you. Uh, is there any questions or contributions? Um, yeah, about the earlier what you were talking about. Yeah. Bitcoin in terms of its value, I think that's a subjective value theory is what you're getting into. Yeah. It's a developing, yes, yeah, a subjective yes. value theory. Um, I mean, that applies literally to any currency or commodity you can think of. It only has value because we believe it does. Um, I guess in the case of gold, um, it's got a proven history. It and does have, it's got that, and it's got intrinsic value as um, electron, electronics and jewelry. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, huh. Which, that alone probably doesn't justify its price, but it does have that, yeah. Yeah. But there's also the argument that a perfect money has no intrinsic value because gold and silver would make brilliant electrical wiring, mm -hmm. but we don't use it because it's too expensive. Right. But that's because of its monetary value, because we think because of that perceived monetary value it has. Right. So if it didn't have that, then it would be it could be used even more for its intrinsic uses. Mm -hmm. But because it's valuable in general, we don't use it that way. Copper does the job pretty well. Yeah. So with subjective value theory, that's important to consider. And the value of a fiat currency from being forced to pay tax in it can be extremely limited because in Weimar Germany and Zimbabwe, their currencies were also used to pay taxes. And people were pretty happy with that because they also used them as firewood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's I think I, I'm still forming my own thoughts about that. I, um, I mean, I can kind of see both sides of the argument. I can, oh, yes, yeah, definitely. yeah. I can see that actually, yeah, in a sense, the fact that gold is popular as money means that actually, um, 
Leah, like I was saying, I, I wouldn't use gold personally, but if I have gold, I, I would value value it because I know I can. Other people will accept it as money. Five thousand years is quite trustworthy. Yeah, yeah, but I, I think uh, it, it's in, in a sense that, in a way, um, I think the, uh, I guess what uh, um, people who would defend, uh, say, uh, gold or prefer gold over Bitcoin would say, well, ultimately, if it really comes down to it, I know that um, people want gold because of the qualities it has. Um, so even though, even if the, you know, it, the value of it collapses overnight, so f for instance, uh, um, I don't know, if, if I, for whatever reason, I, I can still hold on to gold because I can be con quite confident that probably s some, someday, some, somewhere, someone will be willing to swap me something for this pretty little yellow thing that, I've, that they can turn, you in, can turn into a necklace or something. Um, but you know, I, I have, to, have to admit I'm not really an economist, though. Nico? Yeah, uh, due to the subjective value uh, idea. I mean, of course, uh, everything is subject has subjective value, but at the same time, that so whether something is useful or not is, is kind of ob objective, because we can see objective uses for it. I mean, that doesn't mean it is objective for everyone that gold is useful, as, as, you, as you said. Yeah. Um, I, I personally could use gold for for, for, for many things because okay. um, uh, I'm not I'm not uh, skilled enough to, to, to use it that way. But there are definitely very useful things to do with gold and and, and and silver, and that puts a floor under how far gold could fall, which is significantly lower as it is at the moment. I think right, the, yeah. the current prices are basically treating money, uh, treating gold as, as a kind of a store of value more than, than the useful metal. But it, 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 it puts a flaw in how far it would fall. If the price falls, at some point people would start using it for all kinds of stuff and then, then that puts a flaw in, 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 in the price. And that is what, what convinces me that Bitcoin won't, won't succeed in becoming a, a real currency because uh, it is the individual Bitcoin unit is not is not useful for anything. What is useful is the blockchain, but the blockchain isn't scarce. So you have what what's valuable about Bitcoin isn't isn't uh, isn't scarce, and what is um, what is scarce isn't valuable, and that's that's kind of the problem. And what I'm, what I'm seeing right now is a classic speculative bubble, in my view, that will pop like any other bubble, and uh, and then. Um, the trust in Bitcoin will be even less than it was at the beginning, because at the beginning there was at least this idea, wow, we, this could be something great, but once it has actually really failed in the real world, people will trust it even, even less, and, and ultimately every money lives on trust, you know. A, a, the reason why we accept pound is because people still trust that someone will, will take the, these, 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 these pounds, and at the moment people don't trust money, it, it will in, inflate and, and, and will become, become worthless. That's because of subjective value, precisely. Right. Can you, you say, uh, uh, can, can I just elaborate on his point? Well, okay. Yeah. Uh, you said it was in scarce, but it is by definition scarce, right? There's only 21 million Bitcoin in all of that. No, the Bitcoin so, unit is scarce, but yeah. the blockchain is what does that mean? Th that means Bitcoin is not the only application of the blockchain. Yeah, but Bitcoin itself is, is the ultimate scarce item. Like, it, yeah, but it's not useful for anything. Just it because is, it's scarce doesn't mean... Like it's, it, is, it, is, it is useful. It has a function. It's a, it's a medium of exchange. It's a store of value. It's a, no, it's neither. Of it. No one uses it as a store of value. People use it as a speculative well, instrument. That's your judgment, but there's no, that's that's what I'm observing. I, I, I would love to see people use it as a real store of value and a, a medium of exchange. Actually, you're making these assumptions, but I, I don't see all that. I use it as a store of value. So you're going to say like, that's it. I'm not we can come back later. Right? Right? You, you are, uh, you, you are, Richard. Um, how uh, how might uh, cryptocurrencies then come? Uh, the net network economy is enjoyed by state currencies, so the fact that people are forced to pay tax in pounds, for example, um, you know, government contracts are in pounds, the benefit payments are, handouts are in pounds. I mean, surely this is it, surely a sort of insurmountable obstacle to cryptocurrencies becoming more widely used. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess so. I think um, it could be that. Uh, um, 
Yeah, uh, yeah. It's actually, it's, to be honest, to be fair, it's something I've not considered. Um, just off the top of my head, um, it could be that uh, you know governments have eventually recognise Bitcoin in some way. I mean, probably not, but um, uh, uh, but yeah, who knows? It, it, I, I suspect that actually there could it could be that. Um, Bitcoin always remains uh, remains a sort of niche concern, or it actually uh, find or actually it turns into um, a really useful uh, money for a particular market. Um, say, for instance, that maybe you it, it could become quite useful in stock trading, for instance, or something like that. Who knows? Who knows? I, I, I mean, my point is that there's yeah. a symbiotic relationship between um, the government money ripoff and big government in general. So, right. probably you have to get shrink government first before you could sort of, uh, address the, the money rip-off aspect. Uh, yeah, could well be. Uh, to be fair, it's it's not something I'd really considered. Um, I, some surmise that might happen by uh, some point becomes a bit. Mm -hmm. I think the answer to Richard's point is an empirical one, which is that the world's most valuable currencies are not currencies uh, uh, in jurisdictions where the payment of taxes and benefits plays any significant role. The Singapore dollar, the Hong Kong dollar, the Swiss franc, they clearly don't hold their value because Swiss people can use Swiss francs to pay Swiss taxes. So that might suggest that there's something about those sorts of currencies that uh, provides, uh, a, 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 that, that confers a desirable feature. Well then ask the question, what are those features? Well, they would seem to be uh, very easy transferable, very limited in supply, relative, and relatively free of restrictions in terms of how, where, and when you can use them. You might say, just put this out, that uh, Bitcoin shares many of the same features. But they're still state currencies with those network economies. They can be used. As I understand your point, Richard, the network, uh, the network features that you suggest confer value upon fiat currencies are the fact that they can be used for taxes and the fact that they're available for benefits. And my point is the most, uh, many of the world's most desirable fiat currencies do not to any significant degree have those features. What's the relative, relative to Bitcoin sort of turnover, say the Singapore dollar? I mean, I'm sure it's the, the, the in a different league to Bitcoin. You mean, well, we can get into discussions about the velocity of money and so on and so forth. But we, can it well, we can do it privately. Yeah. I was listening to a podcast the other day. I may have been listening without due care and attention. <laughs> but it was um, about Venezuela. Um, yeah. And the government is dicking around with the currency somewhat. And people within Venezuela, especially if they don't want to pay taxes or be somewhat invisible, are apparently using Bitcoin. And the reason is that you don't want the Bitcoin so much, you want the stuff you can buy with it, and you apparently can buy with it. So you get something you want, and they get the Bitcoin, and they buy something they want, and they get the goods do that, as it's supposed to work. And um, whether you could say it's a success or a failure, but it's been turned to, because it's better than the depreciating currency they're supposed to use, and suppose exchange rates, you start meaning the thing, so you can actually have a, a more genuine exchange rate, such that people who have dollars are quite prepared to accept Bitcoin. Well, the other way around. So that it seems to be working there. Yes, I've heard that. Um, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well. Yes. Yes. Too good to be yeah, done. Yeah. An apocryphal field. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, yeah. But given that Venezuela is. It's sort of a special case. Um, uh, it's, I'm not sure if it uh, gives us gives us any lessons for uh, uh, us as well. But I guess that if it if it is true, then it does show that actually that sort of shared consensus that let's treat these as worth as something may can work. And in Weimar Germany, old money stamps, oh, certain yeah. things were could could still be used as money, even when the money was was not much used as money. The official money. So it's like that. Yeah. Do you want to come? Um, I'm all right now. I was just responding. Yeah. Oh, to this point. Okay. Maybe. I suppose the, there are two questions of interest 
well, there are many questions of interest for libertarians that come out of this, but the, the two broad ones are one, uh, how might digital money make the use of money freer and more liberal? That might be the first question. And then the second question might be, how might the underlying technologies create more opportunities for freedom and liberty? Not necessarily the same question. Uh, the answer to the first, one answer to the first question is clearly avoiding monetary censorship, uh, uh, which is becoming an increasing problem, not just in, in relation to things that the government doesn't want you to buy at all, but in relation to other things which you're perfectly free to buy, but life just becomes a lot more difficult because it's quite hard, increasingly hard, to transfer money around. So that's a sort of nice thing. I mean, you know, whether it's the world's greatest thing is perhaps a different question. Uh, and, and then you raise towards the end of your talk, I think, the broader question, which is whether the underlying technologies uh, might uh, create enhancements of liberty. And you gave a very interesting example which is the idea of a distributed Twitter. Yes. Uh, another example, which uh, I know of, which I think is along the same lines, is a distributed marketplace. Because at the moment we have eBay, which is very good, and you can sell all sorts of things. But, 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 but there are lots of things you can't sell on eBay. And again, I'm not just talking about the naughty things. I'm talking about, uh, for example, if it's very hard to sell on eBay alcohol. Yeah, very hard. Uh, and there are applications in existence of the underlying technology which allow for the distributed, uncensorable marketplaces. I'm not talking about the dark net, which is a different thing. I'm actually, t that's just basically an ordinary eBay type thing using bitcoins. I'm actually talking about the market itself being distributed. Uh, and that would then be censorship proof and so on and so forth. But whether these things are actually going to be anything other than of marginal interest, I don't know. Because the reality is 99.999% of people in the world will be perfectly happy with eBay. They won't be particularly concerned about sort of, well, you know, I, I actually want to sell something that eBay is a bit restrictive on, so I won't. 99.9% of, of people in the world are content to use faster payments with their banks to make their payments. Most people are not sending money to Iran and back, but some people are, I don't know. So, so I just don't know. I mean, I, I'm a great fan, both of the monetary aspects and of the implications and uses of the underlying technology. But it is remarkable how conservative the world is and how the reality is that most of the people getting on with their lives are, you know, what we have seems to more or less work. So I throw, I throw that out there as, as to whether we really are looking at potentially revolutionary implications or, or whether it's sort of, it's all good stuff and it's nice to have these things and they do create a bit more freedom but it's probably not much more than a bit. Sorry, that was a speech rather quick. Well, <laughs> well, I suppose the answer to that is uh, it depends on how bad the other stuff is. Uh, if uh, how, how good the banking system still works and so on, as long as it works and people can get their groceries and there's not much, not much hassle with it, then they're going to continue to use it. Why would they look into it? That's why when Venezuela is, is using uh, Bitcoin because the whole system is, is is collapsing and so so they people really have a need for an alternative. But uh, yeah, so I I don't see people quickly changing things when 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 something still works and. Uh, we don't know if it's continued to work or, 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 or not. Yeah. Um, John, how anonymous is ownership of Bitcoin? Um, so um, there's nothing uh, linking you. Uh, uh, that's there's nothing in the blockchain that um, identifies you as uh, an owner of a particular address. However, of course, um, so within the context of Bitcoin, you're anonymous, so no one knows who you are. But of course, in the wider context, um, it's not so uh, so uh, it's not such a straightforward story. So, for instance, the Viagra somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, like, it's like having a, like a randomly generated email. So I can email you. You can email me. Nobody knows who you are or who I am. But if they can link me to that random email, then 
you know, they, they can mm. see the IPC. It's, it's yeah. almost impossible to buy Bitcoin and not on the Silk side, as far as I can tell. It's um, pretty impossible. Yeah. So, so the, yeah, there, there are... The Silk exchange pieces of paper with the... Yeah, so, yeah, so they, they, yeah. there's a physical marketplace that you, you mm. can actually go and meet people and yeah. transact. Yeah, it's um, a damn nuisance yeah, to do anonymously. Yeah. Yeah. But, but there are various platforms, you know, sort of dark web platforms where you can trade or or there are sort of money laundering type things where you send your Bitcoin. A lot of that's controlled by the US uh, deep state, like Tor, for example. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. 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 So yeah, so to properly answer your question, uh, oh sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah. Sorry. yeah. <laughs> You're the okay, so um, so if I if I walk into a coffee shop and uh, pay for a coffee with um, a Bitcoin, um, and I'm they I'm on CCTV, then probably someone can see on the blockchain. Um, oh look, someone paid Cafe Nero uh, the price of a, a cafe latte, sort of just as um, he was doing the same. You know, making that transaction. Oh, it's probably him. That's probably him. Um, and also, of course, I think as someone was pointing pointing out that actually, um, someone who knows your who, who knows your spending history can probably match it up to um, transactions in the blockchain. Um, so people can, uh, although you're anonymous, strictly speaking anonymous, people can connect the dots. Um, and a lot of um, uh, but a, a lot of uh, uh, the uh, um, a lot of uh, if you you uh, you can uh, sort of make yourself a little more anonymous in Bitcoin. Oh, thank you. Um, but that's uh, more about shifting money around in between addresses, only using an address once, and basically trying to leave a complicated paper trail that makes it quite difficult for someone to um, match up to to real life. So. Uh, so you you are anonymous, but um, I wouldn't assume that you're completely anonymous if you're using Bitcoin. Just a quick addition: there are other coins such as Monero and Dash that are more anonymous. Right. They have the big blockchains. Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I I, uh, I sort of pointed to two issues. I, I suppose, as in a broader sense, libertarians uh, and and similar and similar minded people are, are generally interested in technologies that have the potential to make the world a, a wealthier place to create more opportunities for things to be done better and more cheaply and more and uh, uh, and so on and so forth so i suppose there's, there's a third question which is not a directly libertarian question but you do get the question do digital monies and blockchain technologies create interesting opportunities for new things to be done in new ways that, that will allow the world to become richer in the same way that you know iPhones and, and, and mobile phones? They're not of direct libertarian interest, but it's quite nice to think that the, the world is becoming a richer and more interesting place because we can use these things. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think that was actually a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. do you see, you see yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> putting to one side the sort of direct issues of can they be used for freedom of speech? Can do they create possibilities for sound money, so on and so forth? Do you just see the possibilities arising out of things like digital contracts and the Internet of Things and, uh, 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 and the interaction with all that? Do you see there sort of possibilities for? Or just good stuff happening. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think um, uh, yeah. There's uh, a lot of. Uh, I think th actually a lot. Uh, a lot of what will come out of blockchain is just cool stuff. Some cool tech stuff that makes our life uh, sort of easier. Um, I have to admit, I'm not su such an imaginative person, so I'm. I, I haven't. Uh, uh, inspiration hasn't struck me for a, a new uh, sort of. Um, no market, a, 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 a sort of a, a new uh, product that sort of overturns everything, and um, or or actually disrupts the market. Uh, and to be fair, when I've been uh, looking at uh, the blockchain, I've been thinking actually does this give us better ways of doing what we're currently doing, which is perhaps a really unimaginative way of uh, <laughs> approaching the topic. But you know, by by it could well be that um, actually you know it, it's. Uh, 
it marries with some other technology that's being developed and actually produces something that's really I mean, clear. Clearly, a, lo a lot of people with money to invest have taken the view, rightly or wrongly, that there are some ideas out there that will prove to be very interesting and in much demand and therefore very profitable. Uh, I have no more idea than you as, uh, as to whether these are things, uh, whether they are right or wrong, but it's interesting. Yeah. I think that, that, you know, one talks about speculation, but you know, people who speculate on something, and I think a, lo a lot of the speculation here is, is of the form of, uh, I'd like to be in on the cool stuff earlier rather than later, because <laughs> cool stuff can make a lot of money. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. There is any other cool stuff to be yeah, I think uh, one one thing where where blockchain would probably be very valuable is it can eliminate a middleman in, in mm -hmm. many areas, like for example brokers uh, or or even stock exchanges. Now we have all these uh, these systems in place where you have to go and pay them high fees so that you can exchange stocks, uh, and uh, blockchain technology can can produce a system where where people can just uh, immediately exchange one stock for another uh, for for for, uh, for the price they, they agreed on and and so that will el eliminate lots of, of middlemen I think uh, this technology in, in, in many areas which uh, will will be very valuable for lots of people. Yeah, yeah, I, do, I, I agree with that. Yeah. Excuse me, I've just been to the other laboratory, <laughs> which a thousand and one people are ignorant. So. No. <laughs> yeah, um, I believe um, Tor was um, developed by the um, U.S. deep state to allow dissidents in China and Iran to communicate with their handlers. And then we have uh, Google that was uh, initially seed funded by the CIA's venture capital division. And um, you know, if you, four or five years ago, was um, Google Ideas was cooperating with Qatar and the U.S. State Department to um, promote regime change in Syria. So, can we be sure that Bitcoin isn't another sort of deep state operation to try and um, identify people who are up to no good, you know, drug dealers, dissidents, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Uh, well, of course, famously, the creator of uh, Bitcoin is. Uh, 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 well, he's identified by a pseudonym. Of course, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto is not a real person, and probably, uh, in my view, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if he's actually a group of people. Um, can we be sure? Uh, I, I, I'd be. I, I can't think of a way. Uh, I mean, um, I. It, it, could it be a deep state thing? Um, I. would be suspicious. Why would it matter, even well, if it, even well, if it had yeah. been created the by the CIA? So what? Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's certainly what well, it is. Certainly, is the challenge to the state, isn't it? Yeah, it's the state losing power, power. Oh, well. yeah. and that's of course exactly what libertarianism means. Yeah. 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 That's the point. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 Good point, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was going to say that. Um, I mean, as far as. Um, as far as Bitcoin is concerned, um, I'm sorry, you, you better. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, this is a very naive question because. Um, <laughs> Uh, the origins of money also to uh, relationship between barter. Problem, right. uh, I've got this, uh, I know this is true. My intuition is that Bitcoin is really just a more sophisticated version of barter. That it only works until until the parcel stops. So you get the value quoted in dollars, but but it doesn't do what, what traditional money does. I mean, there's no Bitcoin banks. You can't go to to the bank of Bitcoin or the blockchain of Bitcoin and say, this is what I've been doing, uh, you know, I've got a good track record of earning this amount of bit Bitcoin, can you lend me something to capitalise on my business? You've got to take it to somewhere else. Do you see what, you see, yeah, you yeah. See what I'm getting at? Yeah, there's... Uh, 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 yes, there's yeah, it's, the, the, the technology is certainly sophisticated, but this is the problem you're alluding to, why it could drop to nothing, I think, that there's no way of extending its tentacles, if you like, outside. You can have a currency which, which is based on no bank of reserve, but you've got to have something which, which has got something external, even if it's fiat-based. Well, okay, so um, 
Well, maybe I've misunderstood your question, but certainly um, it's, actu it's actually very difficult to, uh, to get into debt with Bitcoin. Um, uh, uh, um, because essentially, uh, essentially, this person who's loaning you money has to trust you that you will pay, and then no, then no, there's no authority. Well, absolutely, yeah. I mean, but there, are, uh, you know, there is function to debt, stroke credit. Uh, libertarians would argue about you know one or the other is more desirable. Yeah. Um, well, uh, just to stimulate economies, if 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 it's kind of just shadowing something else. Just the fact, yep. you, you're onto something there, just the fact that it's quoted in dollars, I think it's kind of a bad thing, but it's kind of unavoidable. Right. Uh, unless it's got that additional uh, stuff which dollar providers provide. Yeah. Uh, well, Same I, thing with the chap over there, the Swiss bank and the Hong Kong bank, David, uh, the Hong Kong bank and the Singapore dollar. They, they do other things other than operate a sophisticated barter system, effectively. Right. Ledger. Uh, as, uh, yeah. Um, I, well, I guess I, I guess once uh, again here, I have to admit that I, I'm an amateur, very much an amateur economist. So, um, you know, but um, oh, sorry. Well, you, you, yeah. you want to come on this? Uh, probably. Yeah. If if, if, uh, if if you're interested, I mean, that there are. Uh, it, so Bitcoin is an infrastructure in a sense. You can build whatever you want on top of it. So if you want to do loans, then you can do that. You can operate like micro loan services. Has anyone done that? Though? Yeah, I mean, there are. Uh, I mean, you can like uh, currently you have micro loan companies all over Europe and the world that do that with fiat currencies. But I think there are some that exist with cryptocurrencies. But there's no reason why that wouldn't exist. It's any any financial instrument you can think of can be implemented on Bitcoin. But well, that would help, though, certainly, wouldn't it? It, it, it would give it. It's too big to fail us, if you like. Sure, yeah, I mean, that, that would add any service that you would add on top of Bitcoin would, would add value to the whole, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's true, yeah, I actually had no idea that was in the process. How come this, there are no Bitcoin multi-millionaires around? Right, so uh, unfortunately, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. There, um, people who got an early are probably quite uh, very rich in terms of Bitcoin, um, but they're probably just hoarding them. Um, uh, it hasn't been in the press, is it? Yeah. Well, not yet. I think. Well, um, well, I, I, I'm a newspaper man. Well, I've never read one. Not one single. Oh, there have been, there have been a lot of articles on Bitcoin in the press. You read a newspaper. <laughs> <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen about twelve. Art I've seen about twelve articles on Bitcoin in the press. Yeah. Okay. Can you read one? Yes. Who? Roger Ver. Roger Ver. Yeah. Yeah. Roger Ver. How do you spell his surname? V E R. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, where, where, was he British? Or? Does it matter? Well, you might have made it up. You can look up Satoshi. Satoshi. Yeah. 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 Two points, first of all, just a quick answer to Pat. I mean, by definition, there are, because the total fiat value of the world bitcoins is something in the order of about $60 billion, yeah, and somebody owns all that. Uh, but the, uh, the point I, I wanted to raise arises out of things said by both by the speaker, Philip, and also by some other people as well, which is this, that uh, one of the very interesting things that can be done with Bitcoin blockchain. In theory, you could do it with other blockchains as well, but you might as well use the Bitcoin blockchain because it's not at all tested. Uh, is you can, in principle, attach any claim or financial asset uh, onto the Bitcoin blockchain. Now, that creates the possibility of being able to have direct trades, direct exchanges, either on a distributed marketplace or even on centralized marketplaces, of shares, debt, bonds, almost anything you want, in a way that would be 
vastly more efficient, quicker and cheaper than we have at the moment. Now that potentially creates one, a lot of extra value, but two also a lot of interesting things that could be done that can't be done now. However, and, and this is where the libertarian aspect comes in, because you know, this is the libertarian alliance meeting, it's not going to happen then. Or it's very unlikely to happen. And the reason why it's not going to happen is nothing to do with Bitcoin will go to zero, because it won't. It's nothing to do with, uh, with uh, the fact that these are not very valuable uses of people they are. It's because there is already, and will be in the future, I predict even more, a regulatory blanket that is going to stop most of these innovations. Perhaps not entirely, but mostly. We've seen the first hints already. Uh, there was a ruling issued by the American SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission, Commission uh, in relation to the use of uh, digital currencies and blockchains, particularly uh, uh, something called Ethereum, uh, for the raising of money for effectively new businesses because that's a, obviously a, a nice way to do things. You can combine lots of new blockchain type technologies in ways that you couldn't before and suddenly a lot of people thought we can raise capital for the projects. And that hasn't entirely stopped, but it, 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 it's, there's been a, a big break on it through SEC warnings. The EU will undoubtedly do the same thing. It's very unlikely, I suspect, that we will see a time when companies are, are, are allowed to put their shares on the blockchain. And uh, so uh, uh, it seems to me that, that that really is the main area of concern. It's not, is it something that, that works in principle? Is there a problem with, with Bitcoin, blah, blah, blah? That's not the issue. The issue is there are really good things that could be done. But I suspect the state is going to stop us. Yeah. No, sorry. No, no, yeah, yeah, to, yeah, to be fair, um, I think um, if Bitcoin has, a, uh, or any cryptocurrency has escaped regulation uh, up to now, it's probably because it's been seen as small fry by the regulators. And prob I think you're right. Um, probably if it does become significant, then there will be attempts to regulate it. Um, I guess that's an, 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 maybe inevitable, and I'm not sure. It's just point to point of order. I mean, the state isn't very good at regulating all these things. No. That was one of Marx's main complaints about the state. It could not govern. <laughs> well, well I, I would agree with you when it comes to things that are really libertarian and really take power away from the state. But when it comes to, for example, putting shares on the, on the blockchain or whatever, I don't see the big interest of the state of, of stopping that. That's just a better service for, for customers and, and so on, unless some lobby stops it uh, be, be before. I, 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 do, I do think we, we, we are going to see lots of technologies succeeding because they are not very freedom orientated. They just provide better services and, and the state doesn't have a huge incentive to stop them. But I am also a bit skeptical about the... Um, a liberty aspect of it because people underestimate I think that eventually everything needs a, a physical infrastructure even 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 a blockchain technologies need servers and so on and they can always shut down servers and prosecute people who do stuff illegally well, on, 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 on the well they can they can make laws where, where they prosecute people who have certain st stuff on their servers and and that will scare off 95 percent uh, yeah. of, of, of all, all, all I don't people. Uh, sorry I mean it's, no, no, it's good, this it's is not. out of sequence uh, I wasn't suggesting that the digital currencies themselves would be regulated in the sense that although there have been proposals for that, but uh, it seems to be very, very unlikely that, that the state either can or would seek to impose a regulatory infrastructure on mining of bitcoins, the way that, uh, the, that, uh, that the protocol developed, so on and so forth. Mm. What I meant rather was regulation as to usage. Yeah. That's the problem. And, I, I, and you might be right, and I might be too pessimistic, but I do see, for example, we have an enormous financial regulatory infrastructure. So not anybody is allowed to 
deal in shares or buys in shares. Oh, and if that's the case, I can see a lot of clamping down. Oh, but on, uh, they, 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 there's no reason why, why the blockchain. Cases. Yeah, but the blockchain can be regu regulated like anything else. But it just eliminates the the middleman and cuts out a lot of. Uh, fees, but uh, they will decide who's getting on the blockchain, uh, who, whose shares are getting on the blockchain. So uh, the blockchain will still revolutionize things. Uh, it's, it, but you're right; the, it, it will revolutionize uh, with the state trying to control this uh, because they, they they are now very well because Bitcoin is 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 getting so much attention uh, attention at the moment. They are now getting very aware that this is a technology that is potentially powerful and potentially dangerous for them, and they are already. Well, that's a freedom uh, issue. Yeah. The attempts by the state, successful or not, to restrict the use that people can make of these potentially wealth-enhancing technologies, mm. is a freedom issue, and it's also Absolutely. a worrying issue because I prefer a world which is richer to a world yeah. poorer. One small message of optimism. There are at least about, well, 190 or more recognized states in the world. And some of those will try to clamp down. In fact, all the regulations you've spoken about regarding financial instruments, the Chinese government did, and people in China did about four years ago. So those, those fears are perfectly legitimate because it's already happened. But with about 190 plus states in the world, those who, those who decide to take a much more light touch approach and you've already got countries like the ones you've mentioned, Singapore, Switzerland, etc. They view themselves as developing as fintech hubs and as well as for trading precious metals. And so they will have much simpler rules. Mm -hmm. They'll have a basic regulatory structure. But they will then attract a lot of the fintech innovation. Yeah. Effectively steal it from the heavier regulators. Well, I, ho I, hope, I hope you're right. But the problem there is that these little entities, these little states that might have an interest in, in being uh, that, that jurisdiction that, that uh, uses this as a competitive advantage, they are not sovereign enough to, to do this. I mean, I was amazed a few years ago now, uh, two or three years ago, they shut down basically all, all, uh, all bank secrecy worldwide in, in one go, in one legislation that says, look, that's enough. Everyone has to everyone has to open their accounts, and everyone opened their accounts. That's because yeah, they fear they want to do business in America, and it's still no, no, because the dollar they can't use the dollar. Mm. They, they said, look, we we kick you out of, of, of the dollar system. Seventy percent of trade is done in the dollar. Uh, you know, on, on your little tax haven island or, or in Switzerland, you will starve to death if 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 if, if you can't use Absolutely. the dollar. And and, that's and, why and, 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 yes, but but as so long as they control that kind of infrastructure. They can basically dictate what kind of regulations uh, uh, countries have, and small uh, jurisdictions won't be able to just be a big Bitcoin hub unless the big big guys agree right. with it. That's the problem. I, I, hope you're, I hope you're right. Sorry, I, I really do. Sorry, no, sorry, no. So, so um, with regards to censorship, I think one interesting example is BitTorrent, which is a decentralized downloading. Uh, you, you can download files uh, via decentralized network and they've tried to clamp down on it but unfortunately it just keeps popping up uh, it, it changes some unfortunately um, unfortunately yeah, yeah, yeah. well, well, what do people say keep saying unfortunately, unfortunately when they don't unfortunately for the government I never do that <laughs> my, right. my arguments or but, but statements it, essentially um, never say I'm sorry you made a bad point uh, the, <laughs> so uh, made the a bad difference point. with uh, uh, Bitcoin and uh, these blockchain technologies which we haven't seen in the past is, is now these are digital so it's very easy to change them to adapt to whatever regulation you know um, is, a, is uh, tries to stand them down so so it's it's a very dynamic system uh, not something that uh, uh, the the state is used to regulate so for example if if you have say a physical marketplace where you can go and stop people but there you're talking about something that's adaptive and, and distributed, so it's extremely difficult to, to control. Now, they could limit its legitimate sort of use, you know, so you can have like a Google based on Bitcoin or whatever, but, but I, like BitTorrent, I, I think the cat is out of the bag and essentially there's no way of really stopping it. I hope you're, I hope you're right. Yeah. Well, with that, I suppose we ought to carry on in the bar. It's now after nine. Oh, but thank you very much indeed, Philip. It's been a very entertaining talk. Oh,